We're going to start with the lightning talks because we don't have enough time to do all of them in the traditional lightning talks. First up is Ben, and off you go. Okay, so. So um, I've been working on some, I think basically the idea here is that we can't really test all of the laptop models that are out there. So we would really like the community to test the laptops for, them, for us basically and then submit the results. And the idea is to have just a very simple way of running these tests and following simple instructions. And you end up with comparable results that are consistent across the student. So one of these tests, for example, is just running firmware test suit um, that Canonical could develop originally in the background and it's just showing the results right now. Um, then there are other tests for keyboard or backlight or um, battery runtime, which is from battery run just running for 10 minutes um, under different load cycles. Um, I have some tests for Gnome you know, system. It's actually restarting the Gnome shell every single time for each test because some tests actually make fresh shells. So it seems sensible to do that. This is the backlight one, you won't be able to see that. But, yeah. Um, it's now just dimming the screen down and up again. And all I do is I confirm that it worked. Um, then, for example, here, the, I think the EVA test is the last one that I actually had in here. It's a There we go. It's there. So with this one, it's like you just hit every key in, on the laptop, <laughs> including the power button, which interestingly, the power button you need to press for like a couple, a little bit. And well, this is there. There's something where my database is obviously wrong. So I'm finished and I continue and. Oh, it oh, I, I think I forgot to press the key. It's, it's too late now. <laughs> I kind of read. Oh, actually, it's not too late because I hit the wrong button earlier. So, what's the Config F, FN is annoying. Oh, okay. I, I pressed FN because I'm not going to register anymore. FN 10. And now the status is passed, so we should finish test. There are no more moves. I think that's all I have in the right now. Well, so if you run this, it's actually just the system D um, service right now. And then what will happen is that at the end you're presented with up upload dialog. And I currently have this very, very basic website to show results. On a private server. But you can, for example, here you can see the battery runtime. For the laptops, did you see that? Hmm? Oh. <laughs> Is it on the screen now? There we go. So you can see that something went wrong with the touchpad there. I think that just would be hitting the wrong button in that case. Um, but you see that the item test for this, for example, this is the the Nova 2460S, we have 11 watts usage, there are 19 too, which is not that great. Then if you compare that, for example, with the Exmo Carbon 3rd generation, you see that you get um, 7.9 watts um, during the 10 minute taps and a 6 minute hour battery runtime. So that's already kind of nice to see. And you also get all the different results like LSPCI, LSUSD, the D2 tests, which just fails so far. There's an error there, it just crashed obviously there, so that's the reason why it failed. Um, and that's basically it. And right now what you can do is, you can actually have a look there, it's on copper right now only. If you search for HW testing, you will find it, and I have some instructions there. Um, I'm planning to build a like, USB stick soon. It's not there yet, but that should come in the next couple of weeks. Thank you.
Are you interested yet? So far, pretty interesting, right? Yeah? <laughs> you all go to sleep more than that type story. <laughs> Alright, great. So, my talk today is um, we need to envision our documentation. And the reason I came up with this lightning talk is even though I've been in this organization for a long time, I've never actually written a GNOME application. Um, and the reason it being is I hate UIs. And, and being an old sysadmin, uh, I decided to take the plunge to do that. So the journey was a little rocky for me. Um, I really did not know how to write a standard app with the GNOME look and feel. Um, even though there are guides out there, I didn't really know, there wasn't one, an example that actually put a head of bar and everything in there last time I looked. Um, so I had, that was like one, one thing that came straight out of my mind. Uh, another one was I had a hard time figuring out what is a logical flow when I decide to write an app. Um, sometimes people say, oh, you should use this. Or, and as well, how would you come up with that? Like, you know, I, when I like to write something, I like to think about how I came to that conclusion. Um, and so sometimes I'm, I'm sometimes given uh, information that I don't understand how people got there. So that's one thing. I think there's a lot of tribal knowledge in GitHub. Um, and I know a lot of you are used to it. You know how to you, know, you copy files and everything and do all that other stuff. I'm not all in there. Uh, I don't understand all of that stuff. Uh, when I run, look around for documentation, developer.gnome.org is pretty cool. Uh, but it's missing things. If I'm writing in Python, I'm actually going to another website to go and look at the documentation. Then I have to go back to developer.gnome.org and do a translation to figure out what is the namespace. Or if I'm brave enough, I'll go and look at object introspection and then figure it out. So if I look at places like Stack Exchange, which is what normal, lot of normal people do when they're writing an application in anywhere else. But if you look at Stack Exchange, there's hardly many people answering questions. So that is generally how people do application writing in, in, on the internet. But our presence has been kind of less. So uh, I, I forgot to mention this, but the, the documentation doesn't have a single voice. You have a how do I section, and then you have developer.gnome.org. They are written in very different ways. And uh, we really need kind of a single voice. <laughs> so, we really need to rework our developer documentation because even though we're writing flat packs, we're doing all these great infrastructure things, eventually it comes down to the application writer wanting, writing, wanting to write an app. And if that experience sucks, who cares, right? No, they're going to give up. I mean, it's, it's important that our, the barrier of entry of writing an app is uh, as low as possible. And the documentation strongly favors the free software mythos of a self-starter who understands, who is not afraid to go into the source code and pick what they need, right? Uh, a lot, I'm, in fact, I'm amazed by a lot of the people who write code, but I've never seen them ask questions uh, anywhere else. Maybe I'm not that kind of developer. I usually only have weekends to work on things. And usually I spend most of that time trying to get GH Bill to work. I mean, in the past, <laughs> and I've lost my time <laughs> in there. So, so great, Flatpak is there now that I've got, now my next stage is 
how, how do I write the code, right? So that's one part. And again, uh, going back to it, there's still not another place to go for help. Uh, newcomers is a great initiative, it's a great start, but we need persistent documentation. We need people asking questions and we need answers because a lot of that is not there. You can ask things on IRC, but then we're answering them over and over again. Documentation is everyone's responsibility. It is not the documentation team's job. It's all of your jobs. All of you need to be cognizant that documentation is the thing that just differentiates all of us from picking something up. Well said, Sri, and your time's up. Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Junong and Open Source Asia, couple favorite. Okay. Uh, there's a TV show. It means the Dutch. Dutch is a Japanese word. That means you must choose one. Okay. So, <laughs> so that's a, the cooking TV program. Okay. So, okay. Uh, we have a we have both a conference in October. So why is uh, Junong Asia is in fourteen to sixteen? So why is for the uh, Open Source Asia? It's at uh, uh, you can see October and twenty one and twenty two. Yeah. So the place is in the China Chongqing for the Zhong Asia. It's a it's a beautiful city, and I al already confirmed yesterday. So another for the Open Source Asia is in Chof. Chof is the a city near the Tokyo. Uh, about uh, 30 minutes by MRT. Okay, so they both in the very beautiful valley in the university. So what's our choice if I want to sub paper or to decide which conference I should come? For example, we must know the full, okay? <laughs> <laughs> For the Junong Asia, you can, oh, it's a challenge, okay? Uh, even you are the Asian people, you live in China, you live in Taiwan, it's an amazing spicy part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so for the overseas Asia side, uh, okay, you, you, you can, you can, you can uh, beat some Japanese food, for, for example, sushi, ramen, and sukiyaki. So what's the other plus point I should choose? I should submit my paper to the Open Source Asia or Journal Asia. It might be have another reasons. <laughs> For example, if I choose the China, you can uh, you can see uh, you can uh, go a skywalk or you can see the three D city. But if you choose the the Japan, you you know there are many animes, TV games, and mm, that's all you know. <laughs> okay, so for everyone people there. For this year, you will select Dutch. So, everyone prepare your uh, barcode scanner, okay? So, that, that's my desk page, okay? So this year, we have two conferences in October. One is, one is in Mainland China, Chongqing. One is in the, the Chof, it's near the Tokyo. The daylight is uh, 15 and 14, okay? So, which can see you because I am both the organizer for the Journal Asia and Overseas Asia. <laughs> we are try we are trying to co-host with, with the uh, other conference. For example, we success with uh, co-host with the Fedocom, with the Fedora, and we try to co-host with the Open Source Asia and other one. And we wish get more. For example, if if someday we can get the Journal Open Source Asia and the Fedcom together. That would be great. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you, Max. Next up we have Zishan. 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 Uh, 
Yeah. 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 Hello. Um, so this year we had uh, not many people nominated, nominating themselves for the board, for the foundation board. So I thought it would be a good idea to introduce what the board is about and just quickly and uh, tell why you should be running for it. Um, how do I change the status? <laughs> So first of all, the first reason for you is you're all, you're all here. So obviously you'll have to know more, at least like it. So, um, uh, and being on the foundation is a very good way of contributing. Um, it's, um, you, I'll say why. <laughs> um, it's, you have some real influence there. Um, you uh, get to decide which heck fests um, are going to happen and if they are going to be funded by uh, the foundation. Um, and all the hackfests that uh, happen um, for GNOME do get sponsored by, by the foundation. So um, that's one of the main uh, ways uh, you can influence the project. And uh, there's some other decisions. Uh, there's, um, there could be lawsuits, for example. You can have some really adventurous times like Siri had, was it last year, right? Or was it last, last year? Yeah, the last year. Yeah, I mean, the trademark uh, battle. So that was a lot of fun, and I, I really. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, you can have those adventures sometimes, but usually it's like the small adventures uh, that along the way that you can enjoy and at the same time influence uh, the project and in which direction it goes. And uh, there is one exception, though. Like many people still think that the you know, Foundation um, also has some. Um, power to steer the technical direction of the project, which is not true at all, at least not right now. Um, I believe we should have some influence, some technical, but that will require changing the bylaws and I will discuss with the rest of the board and if they agree with me and I, if I can I convince them, then maybe we will. Uh, for example, one thing that I have in mind is uh, currently we have a passive role in um, Hackfest. So if um, people um, want to um, arrange hackfest, so they, it's their decision, they arrange it, and they, we just help them out, and they ask us to, to do that. Um, but we never go and, oh, GTK needs help in this regard, let's have a hackfest. We, we don't do that, uh, because that would be uh, steering the technical direction. Um, so I think we should, in that way, uh, influence the technical direction, and we should uh, actively go and uh, uh, see where, in which part of you know, we need help, and, Hackfest would help in that regard, and then we can uh, ask uh, the relevant hackers if they're interested, and then make sure that uh, Hackfest actually happens. But that—that's my opinion right now. But uh, but th that's one of the things. That, that's one of the ways you can influence, right? So if you are part of the board and you think that board should be doing something that it's not doing right now, you can talk to uh, the other board members, and if you can convince everyone, um, then yeah, what you want happens. <laughs> um, People look up to you, uh, they come to you for help. Um, it, it doesn't have to be uh, things that board is doing or what board is responsible for, but they look up to you in general and you're kind of representative of the project. So, um, and then you can uh, direct them, of course, to the relevant person. If someone has problem with, for example, Toto, I can send them to Bastian <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, and you, um, above all, you get to hang out with the cool kids. And um, if you have a cool cat as well, then also <laughs> the cat. Um, uh, these are our current uh, board members, really cool people. And uh, Nuritsi is our president, and she does a really, really good job at that. Uh, I, don't, I can't imagine doing the same job uh, ever. <laughs> so, um, and they are extremely helpful people. Uh, some people are. Some people are um, have been on the board for, for a while, so they know how things work. And when the new people came, like me and Carlos, so they were ex extremely helpful of telling us what to do and what we can do and what we can do. Yeah, thanks for listening. And another interesting fact is that if you have ever been on the board, you are really more likely to submit a lightning talk. Okay, so someone signed me up for talking about chickens. So I'm going to talk to you guys about chickens. Um, chickens! There you go. They hack. 
So they can get them to write your code for you. That's quite handy, isn't it? Okay, so why would you want to keep chickens? They're cute. They lay eggs, about one a day. They're very easy to look after. Also, they have dinosaurs. And by the way, when you come back from Guadeloupe, you find a pile of 30 eggs with a chicken on top of it, and you're sorted for breakfast for the rest of the month. <laughs> so, how do you get a chicken? Um, first chickens I had were rescue chickens, ex battery hens. If I wouldn't have picked them up, they probably would have been killed off and just dumped in a puddle somewhere in the garden, on um, ground. Um, so, they came from a farm. They were abused, very unhappy. But if you don't want to tr start off with one of those, you can buy a pullet. A pullet is a juvenile female chicken. You can raise a chick. You don't know what gender it's going to be, though. So, you know, 50-50 chance that you'll get eggs out of it. Or you can hatch your own. And they're so adorable. <laughs> you know, I get these guys running around the house like three times a year. We have chick therapy. It's amazing. It makes everyone happy. Oh, yeah, they can also sport weird hairdos. <laughs> All over. They can be black. Or brown. This one has a mohawk, actually. They can be ginormous. Or little, tiny, cute little things. Um, that chicken is normal-sized chicken. That's a breed which grows really large. That's a dog-sized chicken. I mean, that could, it, it's basically a dinosaur the size of a dog. <laughs> It'll quite happily have you for dinner if it could. Sometimes they are a little bit hairless. It's a bit like those Sphinx cats. It's weird and kind of disturbing. They also have like moustaches. Chris, wherever you are, that chicken is competing with you, and I think it's winning. Sorry. Oh yeah, they lay all sorts of different colored eggs. For those of you who think chickens lay like only white or only brown eggs, that's not true. They can lay green eggs, blue eggs, everything in between, even like really dark brown eggs. It just it's, like depends on the breed. It's pigment. Okay, so before you start, you need to check if you can keep chickens. Um, for example, in the US, around San Francisco area, you can only keep hens, and you can keep up to, I think, like six in your back garden. So just check your local laws. Oh yeah, and you need to be on good terms with your neighbors because they can be a bit noisy sometimes. <laughs> so what do you need? You need a coop, a run, where the chickens will live when you can't look after them. So like when you're out to do your shopping and stuff, you can't really leave them running around the garden because you get urban foxes and other things like that, which will come and eat them, like rats even, can kill a chicken. Um, they'll need food and water. Food-wise, they'll need nutritional supplement number five, which you can buy from your local pet store. And you also definitely need a friend who's not a gnome, so they can chicken set for you when you're at work. <laughs> this is really, really important. And actually, surprisingly, they're difficult to find those people. Um, yeah, so this is what uh, chicken raising used to look like when uh, we had uh, cages. Nowadays it's similar, but they have slightly more space. It's not very nice, is it? This is what my chickens have at the moment. They've got their little um, plastic coop. You can have plastic coops, wooden coops, anything else you can think of. You can have brick coops even. Um, they've got their water and they've got their food, and they're quite happy. Um, you can have, yep, yeah, something that looks like a shed that's about to fall over. Or you can have a palace. And you see, they don't need very much space at all. Um, so on an everyday basis, I check their food and water, make sure they haven't knocked their water over or spilled their food, which they love doing apparently. Just check that they're generally healthy and collect the eggs. Every week, you need to clean out the inside of the coop, wash out the feeder and water, because inevitably your chickens will get them dirty, because that's what they do when they get bored. And about every half year, you need to clean out the run. And that means you have to... I've got my thing going on here. I <laughs> Shush! Stay out of this, Neil. <laughs> yep. So what sort of problems they can have? They can get diseases, they love fighting, they'll fight at any opportunity they can get. And yeah, your neighbours, they might look like you're having chickens, but usually if you bribe them with eggs, they're quite cool with it. <laughs> oh yeah, and chicks are cute. Alright, um, on to the next one. I actually need to check who's up next. Uh, number six is you, Neil. Who is it? Yeah. And Zishan. I'm good. Okay. There you go. So for those of you who don't know, I fly airplanes. Zishan thinks helicopters are better. 
Uh, yeah. So he's made a, a selection of slides and apparently I should talk about them. No, you're not supposed to. I'm, I'm not supposed to look at that. Oh good, this will be fun. Um, yeah, so I first started flying about five years ago or so. Um, always been interested in, in aviation. <laughs> the annoying thing is I can actually see these in front of me as well. So, so, you can be over there. It, it's going to put me off. Go over there. Uh, and I've always been interested in aviation and flying. It's been a huge season for flying. This is just painful. However, this is going to be a very, very good example of how ugly things apparently <laughs> managed to somehow beat the air in submission. It's a low resolution, that's why it's ugly. <laughs> Otherwise... That's why you don't need to avert your eyes, because of the ugliness. Just, just um, be there. Anyway, so <laughs> I first started flying about five years ago, uh, always been interested in planes and flying. I went for a trial lesson at my local aero club uh, and had a great time. Um, also, as part of that, I uh, bought my now fiance a lesson in a Tiger Moth, so she went up to fly that. I flew in the Cessnas, um, came back down with a big grin on my face, um, and went into the Aero Club and went, have all of my money. Um, and they said, oh, do you want our price list? No, no, I definitely don't want to see the price list. I want to go and do it. Um, so then I was training for about 18 months or so. Eventually got my license, which was great fun. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> um, eventually got my license, uh, which is great fun. Um, then, since then, went on to uh, learn how to fly through clouds. So the amazing thing about um, learning to fly is that uh, after you initially get your license, you quickly get told, if you fly through a cloud, you will die. Clouds are bad. Um, so there is some extra, there's a load of extra training you have to do to learn how to basically take off, fly around, land somewhere else, all without looking out the window, except for the far, last 200 feet. Should point out, you can only do that in a helicopter if you spend about $10 million. Airplanes are better. N not true. <laughs> and you don't want to be in a, in a cloud, it's boring. You don't, you don't see anything. <laughs> except if you live in the UK where it's cloudy. <laughs> all of the time. So, so I went and did that. Um, got my ratings there. Uh, thank you. Um, and so that's great, have great fun things. So you can do things like pop over to France and have some lunch there because it's nice and sunny and not the UK and rainy, uh, which is great fun. Um, since then, I've been doing a couple of other bits. Um, so I have a share in an airplane. <laughs> that's not an airplane. <laughs> uh, I have a share in airplanes which go flying places. Great fun. Uh, the interesting thing about um, flying in airplanes is that they have an engine on the front. And when that stops, what you do is you glide. Because airplanes are very good at flying and very good at gliding. They've got a glide ratio of about, I think mine's about 12 to 1. So each um, thousand feet up you are, you have 12,000 feet that you can fly away. And the thing is, in helicopters, you can land anywhere. So you don't need a lot of distance to fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you've got about a glide ratio of helicopters about three and a half to one, which is about the same as a brick. But, <laughs> and it's, I've, I'm not saying helicopters don't glide. They don't glide. However, I, I describe it less as flying, more such as falling with style. So, um, so since then, um, I also got my aerobatics rating. So you can't do that with, with normal helicopters either. So you can fly upside down, going round, doing loops, things like that. If I did actually have a quite a good long video about this, which I was just going to put on the background, but instead we get these things, which should point out they fly with two things, money and magic. And that's <laughs> nice. um, so yeah, so I think got my aerobatic rating, so I fly around in that. Um, probably doing a competition maybe next year, which would be good fun. Um, but if anyone's around in Cambridge and fancies a flight in a sensible thing that isn't going to crash and kill you all, then let me know and we'll go with flight together. Wait, I have more slides. Well, well, Keep I'm going. going. No, I've got time. <laughs> Next up, we've got Sean. Wait, 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 that's not the beginning. Okay. So, uh, am I starting? 
Hi, I'm Sean. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about communities. I've been doing communities for a long time. I've been involved with the Gnome Project for uh, 14 years. Uh, I've been building communities online around free software for over a decade. But recently, in the last four or five years, I've gotten involved in building communities in real life, like on the local level with people that I see face to face on a very regular basis. Uh, and some things are different and some things are very much the same. So uh, I currently serve on, on two, two other boards, um, treasurer of both of them. I'm an idiot. Um, one, of them, one of them is a grocery co-op that I helped open uh, in my hometown of Cincinnati. Uh, we just got our doors open earlier this year. I'm very proud of that. So um, boards are hard. They can get kind of ugly. You can have infighting and um, political plays, you know, power plays and, and personal attacks. I just want to tell you all, uh, the Gnome Foundation Board of Directors is by far the best board I have ever served on. Uh, the people are friendly and civil and they really want to make things better. And I'm truly going to miss serving on a board that's not completely dysfunctional. So uh, outside of the board though, in the wider world, trolls are everywhere. I have no idea. I really thought trolls were an internet phenomenon. I thought like the pseudo anonymity of the internet created trolls. It's not true. Like in the real world, face to face, there are people who will troll you that like just want to say mean things and, and want you to fail. So uh, these people are toxic and you should remove them from your life. But not spending time on trolls, looking at people that are you know on your side, that are within your community or within kind of your, your wider ecosystem, um, the people expect a lot, right? We know this. We pour our heart and soul into our software. And then the internet gets a hold of it and they're like, oh, that's not perfect and that's not the way I want it to be. And that can be very, uh, it can be very discouraging. And sometimes, sometimes, occasionally, um, people can be mean when they're getting these criticisms. Um, I've had, uh, I've been actually booed. Like I had people yell out no when my name was mentioned in a public forum. Like not in jest, but like seriously. Um, and that, like that doesn't, feel good, you know? So um, what can we do when people are, are coming across very very mean or it feels very mean in their, in their criticisms? Uh, lots of things. I have five minutes. So um, one piece of advice I give is don't reply angry, right? It can be hard to get that first, like, uh, that first impact of meanness and you just want to like, mm, <coughs> asshole. Um, and right, you get smarky and it just uh, escalates things. It gets worse. So maybe Maybe take 24 hours and cool off before you reply. Or maybe get somebody else, like somebody who's neutral and calm, to reply for you, like street. Um, <laughs> and that can help to really like, de-escalate things, remove some of the tensions. So, um, also, burnout is a real phenomenon. We know this. We've seen people, like, they just get emotionally exhausted and they walk away. And uh, you won't get rid of that entirely, but how can we help alleviate that? How can we help keep our, our fellow community members uh, involved in what we're doing? Uh, and so one, again, one just quick piece of advice. Um, thank people. Thank them often and a lot. And sincerely, it can, really, it can really help to know that somebody else out there recognizes the work you're doing uh, and values the work that you're doing and is very appreciative of it. Yeah, good. Um, it can... <laughs> It, it, it really it feels nice to know that people value your work. So all of you, uh, please go thank somebody if, you, if, if they're doing something that you really like, if you're, they're doing work that you really value. Uh, and finally, you know, sometimes um, things can get ugly when you're dealing with communities. Sometimes people can be mean. Uh, sometimes you can be in really uh, toxic, hostile situations. Uh, you know, I've seen some of the flame wars in Gnome, I've seen, honestly, far worse things outside of Gnome. Uh, I've seen ugly things that I don't want to talk about. Um, and so, I just want to tell you all, you know, as you go out into the world and you, and you get into these communities and you're doing all of this work and you're interacting with your fellow human beings, uh, I would ask of all of you, please, please, be excellent to each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Who's just going to set up his hardware? So we've got two demos now. And after that, we might have some stand-up comedy if we've got the right person in the room.
I'm hoping we've got the right person in the room. Yeah. Andre, you can step in if we don't. Okay, there we go. Even Corlos or Pippin. I'm primarily a game developer or actually the maintainer of Gaggle. And um, what I'm going to talk about is um, I gave the title of Encrypted Key Combos for this lightning talk. It is some work that was started a long time ago, but the most recent developments were about five years ago. And um, this is kind of strange code in Gimp. It's a Gimp window. Let's see, and key press, and not this instance, but the GIMP window key press event, which kind of all GIMP windows deals with when it comes to windows, there's this thing that kind of happens. And uh, I want to kind of the actual kind of the C developers and people who write kind of PDK code and similar to that, have a look at that and like ponder what kind of thing is going on here. Uh, because this is recorded, I'm kind of going to leave that this is something to do with encrypted key combos. And I'm going to just demonstrate what happens so people won't see my keyboard. So I have GIMP launched here. And uh, this is running on a Wayland. And this has to do with cultural heritage and uh, preserving things. So I'm going to do some of the things that were mandated in that code that was shown. And see if I can succeed in making this happen. <laughs> so, uh, in Vienna, the GIMP developers decided that it's a pity to have things disappear just because we're moving to GNOME Shell and similar. So the code was kind of migrated and we tried to just, yeah, hide it. It's hard to hide things in open source projects, both with commit logs and people being able to read the code, but yeah, Gaggle Invaders still is there somewhere. I've been working on um, the game this afternoon. <laughs> it's pretty daft, it's not quite as good as the previous demo we just saw. <laughs> but basically, uh, I just want to prove basically that um, you know, if you know web platform stuff, you can make uh, games with GNOME. Um, I'm using a framework called Phaser, um, and, I'm and I'm loading it in with, uh, with GGS. Uh, some key points about Phaser, uh, it's a JavaScript <coughs> engine uh, in its MIT license, it supports multiple physics engines, uh, the source code is available there. And because it's web, um, that's how you include it. It's just that script tag in your index.html and you're away. Um, here's some of the basics about Phaser. Um, I mean, it's literally, it's literally you know, commented as such, but uh, you load all of your game assets in preload, um, create where you set, set everything up, and update is your uh, sort of like your main game loop, which is where you test for collisions and change states and all these sorts of things. Um, uh, GGS, um, I honestly am quite new to it, so I don't really know too much about it, um, but that's the page I read, and it uh, gave me everything I, I need to know. Um, here's the demo. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah. um, obviously, you can see that there's like there's not really any challenge and the sounds cut out and like you can jump on top of these things. <laughs> so there's a lot of things wrong with it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a game. Um, but, 
Uh, yeah, the other, the other reason. Yeah, the, the reason I'm um, for doing this is because I'm um, trying to inspire some kind of a hack fest maybe around uh, GNOME games. So I'm going to start making some noise in the relevant uh, RC channels and uh, email uh, lists. Um, cool. Yep, yeah, I'm going to try and do something about this. <laughs> yes, they, you know. <laughs> um, here's some of the here's some of the tooling I was I was using just now to, to build this. Um, I'm developing a, a, a sort of using Chrome Dev Tools at the moment because the debugging story on GGS isn't great yet. Um, although I heard this morning that it's been worked on, which is great. So thanks. <laughs> um, I used GIMP, um, just make sure you've got it set to pencil, um, you can do pixel art. Um, the sound effects, uh, we'll have a little demo. There's a tool I use called SFXR, which is really cool for sort of generating sounds on the fly. So I don't know how. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you, you basically just uh, you know, keep hitting that button until you find something you like, export a WAV file, um, and you can, you can use that. Um, uh, here's some uh, more resources uh, about Phaser. Um, yeah, feel free to take a photo. <laughs> well, catch the video later on. Um, but yeah, uh, lessmilk.com is a really nice one. Uh, that's a guy who did um, a one game a week project with Phaser. Uh, it's just quite inspiring. There's like 12 games on his site um, that were built really quickly. Um, yeah, uh, thanks. That's me. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so next up we're supposed to have moving and trade-offs. Is the right person in the room? Stand up comedy? No? Okay. Uh, you've just missed your spot. Next up, we've got Greg. Hello. Hi everyone, my name is Greg. Uh, I've been a GNOME user for 10 years, and this is my first live, and this is also Ooh. my first talk of any sort. Um, this is my first talk of any sort, so set your expectations accordingly. Um, I thought this up this morning, I made notes on my phone, let's see what happens. Um, my day job, I work for a web development company uh, here in Manchester called CTI Digital. Um, and we have, well, I've had the privilege of working on some, some really great projects. Um, London.gov.uk, the Mayor and Assembly of London. Um, we rebuilt their website, Great Home Street Hospital, we rebuilt their website, that was great. Um, so we work with clients, big clients, small clients, and we have a, a, a workflow that we apply to, to get that done. Uh, my role is quality assurance, so I test the software, but I'm also involved in making sure that workflow works as it should, and defining the workflow. Um, and one of our key tools is our issue tracker. It's the equivalent of the bookseller. Uh, we use a proprietary tool, it's okay. Um, but one thing it does have, which is good, is the backlog. Um, it's from Agile methodology, which is used a lot in the web. I don't think it's used, we don't use it fully, but we try to. Um, the backlog's really good, I don't think no one uses it. Uh, the idea basically is there's a to-do list for every project, a single to-do list. Um, it is items prioritized by their value to the project. So we have a product owner for each of our projects. It's ideally the client, it's sometimes us. And that person decides what order do things go in. And this is valuable. Rather than just having five priority levels, you say this is high priority, this is high, but which is higher? Um, there's only one way to find out, and that's to put it in a backlog, and you have to make a hard decision of does it go above or below. And this has benefits, or this can have benefits for known. Um, the, the, way, the reason we use it is means we can design before we develop. We know what's coming up, we can plan, we can make sure it fits together technically and UI-wise uh, and all that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, we have to make hard decisions. The benefits to known, I think, will be three. If we were to adopt this for existing developers, they will have a shared focus as to where the project's going next. It's a roadmap. Um, you can look at uh, how, how long it's taking you to do each of these tasks, the, the features and the bugs. Uh, and plan roughly six months we'll have this, six months we'll have that. Um, that's for existing developers. For new developers, they'll know where to jump in because they can see what's at the top of the backlog or near the top of the backlog. And if you mark things as good newcomer boats and if it's near the top of the backlog, you can know that if you take this on, there's a very good chance of it getting uh, incorporated into something the project wants. And finally, for um, uh, we were talking about outreach and engagement earlier, for uh, users to know what's coming next, that'd be great for, for press to know what's coming next as well. So there's less of a surprise when something changes. You can't say you didn't know about it, it was in the backlog. Um, and it will hopefully give everyone, it will increase transparency in that way as well, so users and, and everyone can know what's coming up. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's it. I think that's why we should uh, consider adopting a backlog for each project in GNOME. Um, it will help developers, users, keeps everyone on the same page, gives us clear focus, 
Uh, and that's it. Um, I'm Catherine Matrix. My name is Greg Nicholson, and thank you. And this wasn't stand up. <laughs> it was a stand up of a sort. Um, okay, so my mistake. Previous one was not a stand up comedy. It's about experiences. Come on up. Sorry for the delay. Uh, my name is Jesus. Uh, I'm going to talk about the experience here. I'm a newcomer. That's why. Uh, I use Fedora. Sorry for the rest. Uh, I came from Ubuntu. Again, sorry. Uh, I didn't know what I and all that it implies. Uh, I came here influenced by Alberto Ruiz and Luis too, I speak the uh, I have to say that uh, I've been in a lot of conferences, day conferences, never a weekend one, and this is amazing. Uh, and for me, my experience, what it makes it great is uh, I feel very welcome as the newcomer. Uh, I didn't feel any barrier, anything. I could talk with anyone. Thank you for, for anyone I talked to them. It made me great. Uh, I would like to thank all the talks. They were great. All the talks I could assist. Uh, obviously, I was talking that I could engage more. And <coughs> thank you, you, for encouraging me to come here. I didn't want to. I'm a bit shy. Uh, thank you, Alberto, for pushing me and brainwashing me to come here. And thank you for all the people who made this possible too. Thank you for joining us. Okay, next up we have Matthias about free desktop.org. I can't see him anywhere. There you are. You have to run down, run down here. Come on. Your timer is started. <laughs> Um, so first of all, sorry, I didn't actually think I would be speaking um, because I'm very low on the list and I didn't think that we would go through with it. So um, one thing I just want to highlight uh, in this lightning talk is that it's the shape of free desktop or the state that it's in right now. It was founded initially as a way to toss around projects and ideas between uh, KD and GNOME and then later other uh, projects joined and it became some place where, um, where the different projects which were previously, uh, as we've seen in uh, in the 20th GNOME talk, uh, which are like, not getting along well together, could collaborate on uh, and create like common standards and common um, specifications that were of benefit for both projects. Like the most prominent one is probably Dbus in this case, and, but there are also countless of other examples where this was a great thing. The problem is though that it's running low on manpower and uh, the pages don't look really well maintained. And one of the things I've, um, I've experienced in the past is that uh, there are application developers like, for example, the VLC guys in particular, but also others who are new to Linux who look for advice on how to use the free desktop um, standards or specifications to make their applications work well on GNOME and KDE, because there's still a split between some users using KDE and some using GNOME and some using other things. And for example, the desktop specification or Dbus or some other specifications to inhibit, uh, for example, um, the screen locker are universal and it's, uh, universally, universally beneficial for all the desktops. So when those people come to the free desktop pages and are not able to find any information on what they were going for, or it's rather hard for them to grasp what is going on. While at the same time, for us as developers, it's really on we are not become almost impossible to collaborate with others on the free desktop platform, mainly because the only way you can get stuff in there is by knowing someone. So um, I work on AppStream, which is a metadata format, and on PackageKit, which is also a free desktop project. And for us, it was impossible, uh, especially on the PackageKit side, to get new developers onto the platform because we had to file a ticket, um, ask an admin to add that person to the project. And it took literally, it took almost two years sometimes to get, even get a reply on that thing. And the other thing is if, uh, for example, KDE starts, uh, wants to start a new project and uh, it proposes that if we desktop, they get very mixed replies or don't get any reply at all because they don't ping the right person directly. 
So um, what we have it now uh, right now at the desktop is a problem of missing manpower and not enough people being interested in it, mainly also because a lot of people still see it as a hosting provider. So someone who provides them with, um, with a Git repository and stuff. Well, actually, it's more, uh, it's more than that. It's just, it's a place where people can share ideas and share um, specifications and code and, get, um, and getting a mailing list and getting a Git repository. So this is really just a side effect. So um, I think what in your perception, if you're just ignoring free desktop right now, if you, should, you should think of it as an opportunity to get in contact with other desktops and maybe propose your projects there, see how far it gets and then see uh, whether it, uh, it might be useful for both desktops to compare, uh, to, uh, sorry, to, um, to collaborate on it and to share resources so not, uh, we don't duplicate so much work. Um, the problem right now is, of course, as I said, my first time so you now the missing manpower and I do intend to do something about that to uh, basically try to find out who the people are uh, working on uh, on the free desktop infrastructure, this is mostly done. I have, pre have an email prepared, which I didn't send so far because I myself didn't have enough time for it. But um, yeah, this is a thing that I would I would love to fix, and I would like to uh, invite anyone who has an uh, an interest in uh, in working on making free desktop better and uh, propelling it into the future um, to like talk to me and uh, let's see what we can do about it. Um, yeah, if, if you want to. Uh, get an idea of what it is today, just open freelesto.org and observe the title tag, which is currently saying www, instead of like what it is actually. Um, so yeah, this, is, this has been that way for about two years and nobody bothered yet to fix it. And I think it's a neglected piece of infrastructure and we should really do something about it to like, keep it up to our standards. That one's it. Hello. Um, is this working? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, so I am one of the free desktop sysadmins. Um, I have not actually used this ability for probably three years or more. Um, the entire talk was entirely correct. Free desktop is deeply neglected, and this is really, really bad. Um, in reality, most people end up using GitHub uh, or whatever, and they have less center of gravity for communications and hosting and pull requests and user management and all that stuff. Um, the, most of the free desktop sysadmins have decided the best thing to do is basically get rid of it. Um, but what we want to do is basically host our own GitLab. Um, but we need a cloud hosting provider to donate us lots of cloud money, and then we will move free desktop onto that, and we'll host GitLab, and it will be wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Meet you at Thank you very much. Anyone interested in cloud blocking? I was told I have two minutes. Um, let's see. Uh, so, uh, user experience is very hard, as you know, and accessibility is very hard. And then I invented this thing called off offlineability, which is in between, I guess. Uh, what is this? Uh, last year I spent two, two weeks in the US and I, uh, and I was cheap enough not to buy a mobile data card, so I suffered. And, um, and let's look at some examples of the applications that do not have good offlineability. And I'm no authority in design. Uh, and also, I'm going to show mobile applications because those have a lot of resources and, and money and stuff. So Chrome knows that it's offline, right? And it has a very nice game. But what would be nice is that it, would, it could cache the, the, the static web page that I, that I was trying to see, like they did in the 90s. That would be very useful. But you know, fair enough. This is OK, right? But Netflix now has downloads. And uh, I downloaded some stuff. It was a long flight. And uh, when you open it, it says, could not load data, retry. So you have to go to the menu and go to the downloads. And I don't think that Ellen or Robin would approve. Uh, but I don't know. So, but you know, fair enough again. Uh, certainly simpler, uh, like reader apps behave better. So I go to the, this is like Feedly. Uh, and I wanted to read some feeds. And it's, it, you know, it's very technical in the way it fails. Uh, there's no offline capability. Uh, and Spotify has a, an offline mode. So you go here, it says you're offline. Yes, it's still not, not two minutes. So what do you mean? Okay. This is embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but this is cool. Um, so, yeah, talk to your users, and because this is in Chinatown, and what that red hat says is that according to. 
Okay, it's been two minutes, I'm sorry. Okay, Chris, where are you? Chris, cool. They're still setting up. Yes, you. Right, you've got 30 seconds to do yours. I'll just do it from right here. Oh, hold on, I can turn around. Hi, my name's Chris. I live in Berlin. We have a conference coming up. It's called All Systems Go. Uh, you can find it at all-systems-go.io. Um, and it's about uh, foundational user space Linux technologies. Um, so what I've always loved about GNOME is they've never really known where to stop. And so when something doesn't work, they'll implement it, you know. Um, you know, Dbus is a really good example of that, but there's other things, you know. One could maybe even include System D in that. Um, and so this is basically a, um, a conference about that le level. It doesn't go deep into the kernel at all, um, and it doesn't really go in the app area. It's that common base that everybody uses. We would love to have you guys there. Um, so please hit tickets. Thanks, Chris. Okay, it's um, the end, sadly. That's not great. Um, on the plus side, it's not the end, because Yay. tomorrow is <laughs> the <laughs> conference. So we will not be here tomorrow. Don't come here unless you want to eat more delicious food in the canteen. We're in the glamorous shed, which is 10 minutes walk from here, near Oxford Road, nearer to town than this. Um, I won't give you full directions because it should be really confusing. But if you look on the open street map, there'll be more maps for the shed and then you, then you'll get directions. It's near Oxford Road. Um, well, the entrance is on the side of the building, through some glass doors, pretty much the last glass double doors that you come to. If they open, then there's the one, those are the ones that you go through. The friendly receptionist. Um, and we'll be there in lots of different rooms spread around the building. Um, we'll put up some signs, hopefully. Um, I'll be there from 9.30. That's the other important bit. The schedule for the other conference is on the wiki. Um, we're going to do an award for best badge. These are the nominations. Douglas. <laughs> Kekun. Pat, some He's also done that on one of the buildings now, but now. <laughs> Olaf. <laughs> Nori. And that's too far. <laughs> so we're going to have the prize is going to be a red t-shirt. And there are two winners. First, Nori. <laughs> successfully work architecture into their badge. <laughs> okay, so come to the info desk afterwards and there will be prizes. Uh, on the subject of prizes, we're going to work out which house you've won. 
using the complex fair system. Uh, it's not Wilbur, it's not Wanda. I'm in Wanda, that sucks. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Gaggle. Gaggle House. Who leads Gaggle House? A Gaggle House leader. Here is the here is the house prize. Stand up, Gaggles. The prize is. I don't have great balance skills, so this isn't going to work. It'll work for a little while. It's also a musical. Um, so we need to say some thanks. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that's helped out with the organisation. It's going to take way too long. Um, some people in particular, I'd like to call out Lena here, who's yeah. worked tirelessly yeah. for all the jobs about. Um, I would also like to thank everyone else that's been on the um, regular conference calls that we've done that have been really fun. Um, Alan, Alberto, Javier, uh, Neil, and the Ritzy for some of them. Thank you all for being patient, getting involved with ideas, um, listening to me and not know what to do, um, and generally helping things run. Um, we need to thank all our sponsors, without which this can't possibly happen. Um, so I'd like to say a huge thanks to Coating in particular, not just supporting financially, but also the management have been really supportive, and most of my co-workers have been really supportive, like sometimes I've gone into the kitchen and ranted about something, and then someone said, well, I can help with that, and then I can do it anymore. So that's been great. <laughs> uh, thanks to Coating, thanks to Private Internet Access, for a huge sponsor, not only sponsoring at platinum level, but also donating a laptop, and a bunch of BBN subscriptions, one of which I won. <laughs> I give thanks to the gold sponsors, Endless, Google, and Red Hat. And all the other sponsors who uh, are on the panels outside and have time to listen to them all. Um, so I'd like to thank all the volunteer teams. Everyone in Red Shirt. And I'm about Red Shirt. Uh, okay, come down to the front, volunteers. Oh, no, no, stand up, actually. Stand up, that's going to be easier. negative emails from anyone. I've, I've had to give bad news to people, I've messed things up, uh, and everyone has been really helpful. Everyone who's asked for help or asked for questions has always been polite, and even when I've said no, I can't do anything, I said, well, thanks for trying. Um, and this is what makes knowing great, really. Everyone thinks about being positive, not being 
critical of things that people don't have any control over. This is what makes me really great. So thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> So, the moment everyone has been waiting for. Not so fast. And the winner is. Does that give you a hint? Amria! Ismail, do you want to come on down? Where's the microphone? We have a microphone. Hi. Um. Uh, yeah. So we have um, there's a very advanced presentation in <laughs> advance. Well, me se oye? Well, okay. Um, <laughs> ah. USB sticks supplied by uh, Quality 2018 as suspect. <laughs> First of all, um, um, as a good Spaniard, I have a broken English, so sorry for this. Um, it's a trademark of the country. Um, I could give you a, a, a great discourse because I'm a smart guy, but I think it's not necessary. Um, just to say thank you, uh, the organization, the foundation, for trusting us. Uh, it will be an honor to host all of you um, next year in Almeria, Andalusia, Spain. It's not a, a, a so hot place as a, somebody believed. And if, if you are ready... Um, he doesn't have the right codec installed. Oh my! Oh my! <laughs> However, it's going to be worth waiting for. Uh, um, I'm not sure how we'll do this now. How many of you... Uh, no, knows the Irish, the Irish, uh, the Pogues band, the Pogues, the Pogues. Ah, okay, okay. Sorry, but broken English, broken English. <laughs> Do you understand me? <laughs> Yes, I'm ready for that. So the Pogues uh, so has something to say about the Almeria experience. So, audio, okay, please. Ah, we have audio. Hola, leche. Ya me la jodido. No, please. It's a Macintosh, an Apple. It's supposed to work. Unfortunately, we're just going to have to finish the closing while watching the video for Fiesta by the Pogues. Which I think is going to be pretty entertaining. I personally am really excited to go to Almeria. Um, I don't know how I'm going to survive the heat, but hopefully they both wear shorts and maybe no top. No, it's, it's, it's not so. It's not so here uh, as in other places uh, of Andalusia, which uh, uh, the interior could be really, really hot as summer. But uh, last uh, Thursday we finished uh, the academy from the KDE community, and they were delighted. And most of them are from Germany to north. So if they can be in Almeria without a problem, pff, most of you uh, <laughs> could do without without a problem. Um, uh, I don't want to, to, to take uh, so much time, but uh, just to say that in Almeria we have um, um, a motto um, some years ago that in Almeria never, uh, no one feels a stranger. So I hope you share the same feeling after what I finish next year. Thank you very much for trusting us and uh, I'm waiting for you there in the south of Spain. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ismael.
So there's only one more thing to say, which is... Not quite. There does appear to be one person who hasn't been thanked yet, who I know has put an incredible amount of work into organising this squad deck, who appears to be stood front and centre and not willing to accept any thanks so far. So, as I know, it uh, can almost kill you organising conferences and, and being the sort of point person. Um, hopefully you'll get some bit of a break afterwards. Um, so thank you very much to Sam. Thank you everyone for coming.